Uh, hi everyone, I'm Caro. I'm a senior software engineer at a company called Video Labs. We're a consulting company behind VLC, and I'm going to talk about debugging, things your senior hasn't told you about yet. So why am I talking about this topic? Well, as it turns out, 50% of our time is spent with either fixing bugs or making code work. And according to this random chart that I found on the internet, this amounts to 312 billion spent per year for the entire global software industry. That's quite a lot. So why are we actually spending that much time on debugging? So what are the problems that we face? Well, for one, we sometimes don't have enough information. In this case, I'm somewhere in UIKit, and I'm stuck there. I don't know how I got in there and what part of my code caused this issue. Second, we have time-consuming tasks that we do over and over again. In this case, I tried to print the frame variable on a UI view, but it told me, hey, I cannot find um, the frame on your object of UI view. And I'm like, well, but it definitely exists on there. And then I remember, oh, I've got to import UIKit, and then I actually get the data that I want to. And third, sometimes we simply don't know about good practices. So I will tell you a little bit about defensive programming and how to use asserts and precondition. So what are the covered topics? I'm going to tell you how you can get more information when you need to fix a bug or a problem. Then I'm going to go, up, uh, go about how you can speed up your day-to-day -day debugging. And last but not least, about best practices for error handling and debugging. So let's start with, the, with an example that I encountered earlier this year. I was working on the tvOS app, and I had an unresponsive UI. I couldn't scroll. I couldn't click. Images wouldn't load. And when I stopped the program, what I saw was this. My memory spiked up, and there were lots of objects being allocated. And when I looked at the stack trace, I saw that I was somewhere stuck in UIKit. So now you wonder, what did I do? So here's what I did. <laughs> I was realizing, OK, Stack Overflow can't help me at this point. But after doing this for a little bit, I remembered, oh, there's this one command in LRDB that I could use for this, LRDB to the rescue. And I used register read. Um, register read helps you to print out the general purpose registers. And I'm not sure if you can see this in the back, but in register 10, I have a reference to the VLC network image view. That was enough information for me at this point to find the evil line uh, via brute force and to comment it out and then to fix my problem. So I was a happy developer. My program worked. But just about a month ago, I found out that there is another way. Tyler Fox was actually tweeting about this wonderful, underappreciated uh, debugging tool in UIKit, which is the layout feedback loop debugger. The layout feedback loop debugger is a launch argument. And for those of you who don't know uh, what a launch argument is, I'm going to show you how you can actually enable them. So when you go on Edit Your Scheme, there is a tab called Arguments. And there you can edit um, a number of launch arguments. And underneath it, there are also environment variables that you can add. Apple has been so nice to give you already a couple of them in the Options tab. Like um, the non-localized strings, for example, is a launch argument, um, as well as the system language and the application region. If you enable, for example, the non-localized strings, you will see in caps lock in your app where you didn't localize a string. If you change the region, it will, for example, say that you're in Cupertino, even though you're in Berlin. So you can test your app in those different regions. Obviously, not every of those launch arguments is listed in here. Um, under the Diagnostic tab, you find a couple of the environment variables. So you can enable, for example, malloc scribble, which will tell you what kind of objects are um, allocated, and so many more. So um, let's go over a couple of the launch arguments that uh, you can also have. Um, I'm going to talk about the UI view layout debugger, um, the concurrency debug for core data, um, migration debug and SQL debug, and NS trace events. So first up, the layout feedback loop debugger. So this is a large argument um, that where you can set a threshold. And the threshold can be a value between 50 and 1,000. And it counts the number of views that um, run layout subviews. Once you hit that value, 
it will hit an exception and it will dump info into a log. And if you don't like to look at logs, you can just stop there and then you can print the layout feedback loop debugger on the UI view layout feed loop debugger. <laughs> um, if, I know this is a lot, and um, if you want to actually learn more about this, there's this great talk from 2016, What's New in Auto Layout, by Marianne Goldine, and she's talking 50 minutes about how you can actually analyze those logs, what you need to look for, and it's an incredible, great talk. Okay, but this is great for auto layout issues and um, about UI debugging. But what about, for example, core data? It's widely used but it's not always easy to debug when things go wrong. So here's a launch argument that will help you with concurrency. If you turn um, concurrency debug on, uh, you will see an LLDB, a little message that lets you know, hey, core data multi-threading assertions are enabled. And when you use your app, this will crash or it will stop when you try to access an object um, context or manage object from the wrong um, dispatch queue. A little fun fact about this, uh, Apple decided with iOS 6, oh, it might be a great idea to turn this on by default. Well, a lot of apps started to crash, and Apple soon decided, ah, uh, maybe this wasn't the greatest idea. So yeah, if you run into this, you will see this wonderful, all that is left to us is honor. <laughs> and <laughs> If you want to learn a little bit more about how you can resolve these issues and why they are happening, there's a great blog post by Ola Begemann from 2014 um, that will tell you how you can resolve these. Okay, uh, the next one is um, migration debug and SQL debug. So if you turn on migration debug and you're doing a core data migration, this will log um, information about exceptional cases when it migrates data you will get hash values and you can then look at them. If you have, there's a program where you can actually see the objects in your database. Um, and the next one, SQL debug. You might wonder why there is a three. Um, all the other launch arguments you normally toggle on and off. In this case, this is a value that determines the verbosity of the logs. So three is the highest value, and it will give you a lot of logs, and you can see what is actually happening under the hood. You see all the SQL statements and yeah, see what actually is being done. And something that I found out while I was researching this topic was you can actually also pass in log launch arguments at runtime. So in this case, I was um, passing it into the text edit and uh, I turned on NS trace events. And when I was hovering the mouse over the text editor, it would print all of the events that it was receiving. And that was super interesting for me to see. I didn't know about this, actually, before I was preparing this talk. So there are lots of hidden launch arguments and environment variables, and these are just some examples. If you want to find out more about them and how you can, for example, visualize constraints or lock more info about objects, um, I would definitely recommend those two um, tech notes by Apple. One is the iOS debugging one, and the other one is the macOS debugging magic talk. And um, there are also tools listed, and it's, it's an old document, but there's still so much valuable information in there. Okay, so this is great if you have a certain bug or problem that you need more information about, but what if you just try to make things work and need to inspect objects? So let's go over some typical time-consuming tasks and how you can save time here. So first up, I'd like to show you an easier way how you can inspect private properties without having to subclass. With Swift 4, uh, we introduced key paths, and you can easily use that um, to observe changes. In this case, um, I observed the background color, and I can lock the changes of the old value and the new value. And not before I was just subclassing it, I would replace everywhere the type of the class, and I would overwrite, for example, set frame. And then when I needed to, when I found out what was going wrong, I had to re revert all of this. So this is an easier and faster way to do this. Um, next up, the property that was not found on your application. Uh, a short raise of hands, who has ever encountered this issue? OK, everybody. So I'm not sure if everybody knows when that actually happens. Um, we have two contexts when we're debugging. One is the Objective-C one, and the other one is the Swift one. Objective-C is actually chosen by default. 
So what we have to do is we have to actually tell it, hey, uh, the object that I'm handing you, uh, that's actually a Swift object. So this was something that I was doing when I was just starting with Swift. And that's obviously not the easiest way, and it's very tedious if you have to do this all the time. So then I found out, oh, you can just import UIKit, our foundation, and then I don't need to do this anymore. This also, by the way, removes the need to um, cast structs in a lot of places. But that's also really tedious. So the next step that you can take is you can create a breakpoint on UI application main. And you just add a debugger command to import UIKit and import foundation. You check um, the checkbox that it should automatically continue after evaluation. I think Shishtof wrote a blog post about this. Um, that's already great, but there's even something more that you can do. Because right now, this is only available in my project, right? But I might have multiple projects. So what you can do with this is you can move that to a user breakpoint. And if you want to be nice to your colleagues, you can even make that a shared breakpoint. So this obviously saves you a lot of time already. So I was wondering, are there more like this? And then I found um, the NSKVO deallocate breakpoint. So this will break in places where you still have observers around and should have removed them. You know, sometimes you will crash later on when a message is being sent to um, this object. But this will actually alert you early on that you should have now removed that observer. And next one up is you can actually edit your exception breakpoint to print out argument one. You wonder, what is argument one? Well, that's actually the exception. And before, I always had to press continue, 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 until finally it would show up in my logs. This will immediately print this. So these were just three examples of useful um, user breakpoints. And um, if you want to learn more about this, PSPDF kit uh, had a great blog post about this, where they have so many more user breakpoints. And they've added to it um, over the over the last months. And they also link to an article um, that will teach you how you can script breakpoints, which can be very interesting. So this is great. These breakpoints save us time while we're making things work. And the KBO breakpoint alerts us about a bad state early on. But we sometimes know already about cases um, where we entered a bad state. And how can we make life for our fellow programmers easier in this case? So. Let's talk about good practices for error handling and how we can save time here. So the first thing that might come to mind are assertions. In particular, assert and assertion failure. So what are assertions? There are runtime checks to catch programmer, early, um, programmer errors early on. So they ensure that certain conditions are met. Um, and if not, your app will terminate early on. So here's an example for this. We're checking in the condition if a string is nil, and if not, um, uh, we're going to break there. We have the message invalid parameter. And what is interesting about this is we have a message that we can actually forward to the user and can tell them, hey, this is, by the way, what is going wrong. And um, you can see in the next line here, this was, would crash because the string is um, force unwrapped. And the message parameter is actually the interesting part, because you can educate your users how to use a function or how you should use your API. And it might come, become a little bit clearer in the next example for assertion failure. Here we can use this to um, actually guard against code paths that shouldn't be um, executed. Here, for example, I have cells that are being created. And in the default case, I'm just saying, hey, um, you have a new cell type that you might want to add to the cases. And further down, um, so there's something that is even more helpful. Um, I tell whoever is using this part of the code that the cell is null, but not only that the cell is null. I'm actually telling him, hey, um, did you forget to register the identifier? So not only do I tell him what went wrong, but I can also give the user hints um, about what he can do to fix this issue. Um, something to note about assertions is that they're only turned on in debug mode. So what determines, actually, um, if we're in debug mode? So that's the Swift optimization level. And we have three levels here. We've got the debug one, which is O none. We've got the release mode, um, which is minus O. And then we've got unchecked release. The unchecked release one um, will give you blazing performance, but it does that by removing lots of error checks. 
If you do this, for example, you wouldn't get the array out of bounds um, check, you wouldn't get the unwrapping nil one. So in the worst case scenario, this will lead to memory corruption. So you really shouldn't do that unless you really, really know what you're doing. So as we found out, assertions are only enabled in debug mode, but what if you need to guard against the bad state in a release build? So for this, we've got precondition and fatal error. So this is for condition where it would be too dangerous to continue because you might, for example, corrupt data. Precondition and fatal error, um, precondition failure and fatal error are, by the way, also enabled in the unchecked releases. So let's look in a, at an example from the Swift library. Here we've got the repeated value function, and this lets you create a collection with the same value repeatedly, and that depends on the count. The precondition here is catching that the count is a number that is bigger than the zero, and we actually tell the user then, oh, um, that count should, not, should be non-negative. If we would have a negative value later on, we would crash, so that's better to exit early on here. Next example is for fatal error. This is actually in the NSDate formatter class, which uses an underlying C, a C library, um, the ICU, which is the international components for Unicode library. And as you can see in the guard statement here, we have a fatal error, which happens when we're unable to talk to the ICU. This is an unrecoverable system state that we want to avoid, and it doesn't make sense to, to go on with the program at this point, so we're crashing here. And something that I found out when I was like, looking at fatal error was um, apparently some developers are using this to detect if they're running on a jailbroken device, and then they use fatal error so that people can, for example, not cheat in their games. I found that very interesting. So let's recap. Um, we saw assertions are enabled in debug. Um, we saw that those are not enabled in release, but precondition, precondition failure, and fatal error are. And uh, in the unchecked release, we still have precondition failure and fatal error. So what did we learn about today? Well, we learned that we can use read, register, and launch arguments to get more information when we're trying to fix bugs. We learned that we can use key paths and user breakpoints um, to save time when we're trying to make things work. And last but not least, we learned about assertions, preconditions, and fatal error to educate our fellow developers and users um, how to use our APIs. And um, these were some of my resources. There were great um, talks and blog posts about assertions. These are obviously additionally to the ones that I already mentioned. And yeah, that's it. Thank you.